truth in this art. I am your host, Basically Innovation and Civic Wealth. Please welcome Michelle Geis. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. I, I, I copy that. I just copy and paste. No work was done. Uh, <laughs> I tried to put my seasoning on it, but I was like, you know what? You're going to botch a word. Just, just read it. Just read it straight. <laughs> we get so thick with words sometimes in, uh, the, in our work. Yep. Yeah. My, my, my tongue gets in the way and it's like, you didn't mean to say that, bro. <laughs> So, so give us the vital stats. Tell us a little bit about your background and what made it, what motivated you to work within the Impact Hub in Baltimore. Yeah, I mean, so um, I've been in Baltimore now for ten years, uh, as of this summer, and um, it's home now. And but I, got, I came here uh, to go to public health school and just like fell in love right away with Baltimore. I was, it was important for me at that time to not only know it through that lens. And so I was getting involved in um, Wayluck uh, Community Farm that's in yeah. the Reservoir Hill and working with um, Holistic Life Foundation that does work with kids in schools. And I was just like meeting people who were incredibly involved in, in neighborhoods and communities. And I was like, this is the energy of that was really um, drew me in. And I just like fell in love with it. And at the same time was seeing a lot of people do work that was like way less supported than what it could be, should be, um, they had big ideas and like small budgets or they had, they were tackling huge complex issues through their work and like, again, like not enough kind of like, uh, resources behind the work. And I was like, um, that was something that got me, got my gears turning. Yeah. Um, and wanted to, I was just like, I really like believe in and love all of these people. And like, <laughs> what is it gonna kind of take to take the lid off of that? And like really give people oxygen to do what they're trying to do. Um, and so yeah, I like, I linked up with the other two co-founders of Impact Hub, so Rodney Foxworth and Press Adams. And um, they were already organizing these like morning, these social enterprise breakfasts, they're called social ent breakfasts, which is kind of hard to Soch. spell and say. <laughs> and, um, and the whole idea of that was just to connect people. They were, um, knew a lot of social entrepreneurs at the time. And um, that kind of, even that word was starting to just emerge and show up in, in the world. And um, but they were bringing people together and like that was creating an energy and that was creating yeah. this kind of like community and people were coming from all different backgrounds and not working necessarily on the same issues or in the same sector and they were like it was happening once a month and people were like this is amazing like this should happen all the time I feel so good this is the kind of Baltimore I want to be in and um, we were just volunteers at the time and just organizing these events and didn't want to bottleneck it you know and so a lot of the idea of um, focusing on space was like creating a container for that energy like yeah. creating a place where people could come where they could organically find each other and like organically be making those connections where they didn't have to wait for us to like pop an event right up and they could just like serendipitously bump into each other yeah. and the other thing about it is I think space can be an amazing um, like tool for visibility too so I, we felt like it we could go around all we wanted and say like, oh, there's all these amazing people doing incredible work, but like it helps to be able to be like, and they're right here. Yeah, <laughs> you know, absolutely. they're all, you know, they're all in this space. And so, um, that was a lot of the motivation, um, to think about space at all as a tool, but it's still like at the center of it is like all about like the people who show up and the like ways that they weave their work together. And it's, it, what I'm hearing is kind of one of the things, and we, we both can uh, speak to it on, I guess, in different ways, you being a, a student, me being an employee or such, uh, the, the the notion of being decentralized. People always talk about, eh, you know, how is it so decentralized? It's, it's kind of like that, that vibe on the university side of things. And with what was being described a moment ago, it's like bringing all of these folks together in this kind of serendipity sort of way it's like oh this makes sense you're doing this oh you you should know this person hey have you been to this have you been here and i i think that's gotten better over the last few years but thinking back to probably closer to 10 years ago mm -hmm. it wasn't any way shape like it was very and it's still some some remnants of it very clickish it's like yeah people know who they know and they hang out with who they hang with and Nothing in terms of like traction and impact to be punished about it uh, really happens. It kind of gets halted. It could easily be halted, I think. Yeah, and in that same period, so that was like 2012 that those breakfasts were happening. So mm -hmm. it is just about 10 years ago. Yeah. And um, 
we are also noticing a lot of people kind of repeating the same ideas over and over again. Like I don't like to think about duplication because I actually think a lot of times there's nuance to what it is that people are doing. Sure. So like your mentoring program might be different than your mentoring program, but we were finding all, we're meeting people too who were like, I'm trying to start this thing and I don't know where to start. Like, I don't know what's already out here. I don't know how to add what I want to add. And so we, that was the other piece of it. It's just like you kind of avoid, um, people feeling like they need to start from scratch or feeling like they need to like tackle everything themselves as one individual and mm -hmm. like being able to be like, Oh, like, well, you're really into podcasts and yeah. I'm really into this. And like, we can link those two things up instead of me being like, I'm doing this and my podcast <laughs> and my this, you know, it's like, what does partnership look like at the end of the day? And, and whatever that part, whatever type of partnership it may be, because Sometimes it feels like it's a dirty word. Sometimes it feels like it's a weird word. And it's like, this person may be really good at something you have no idea about. And there's some merit in just knowing them, having a cup of, co having a cup of coffee and, and being able to connect with them. And really, I think it strengthens uh, a community. Yeah. And I think where we're located, right? This is in like Station North, not by an accident, I think. And near the colleges, near a lot of thought, near like the artists and the creatives. And it's like concentrated right here. Yeah. I mean, the other thing that really drew us into this space, this is actually, so we're in the Center Theater uh, yeah. right at North and Charles. And um, it, the building was vacant when we like first toured it. Um, and so we were really glad to be part of like bringing something back to life. I think if we had been looking six months earlier or six months later, we would not have been able to even <laughs> been considered for this space. But, um, but they had it open. And um, what I think is really incredible about it too is it's in this kind of like a little bit of neutral ground, right? Like it's not east or west. It's mm -hmm. not north or south. It's like kind of in this space where everybody can walk through the doors and be like, feel like they're, um, you can find commonality or you're not like in somebody's zone. Yeah. And that was something I think back to in that like 10 year ago reality, like a lot of territorialism or a lot mm -hmm. of like, Ooh, don't step in my space even. And not just from doers, like foundations can be that way. Like a lot, plenty, <laughs> uh, institutions like really can be like, this is my zone. And so yeah. we didn't want that to happen. And, um, so even having the physical space be where it is, is like a sort of powerful tool. And we've seen that manifest, like there's been a lot of um, coalitions that have met here. And like, I think it's easy for them not to be on like so-and-so's yeah. actual like office space, but be in this kind of like the space that's about trying to advance the idea. Totally. And when I come past here, I always see work happening. I always see something going down. Like I record at um, a big improv on Fridays. So I'm always like, come on, what's, what's happening in the impact of the night? And I was like, oh, okay. I know her. I know. Oh yeah, you cool. All right, let me get to where I'm going. Um, yeah. So I, I want to put this one in there. I want to put this one in there kind of early because um, it was top of mind when I wrote these questions. Uh, and I'm going to try to be as clean because I've been calling him something else recently. Uh, recently, Tucker Carlson had, took a weird shot at Baltimore, but it's not an unusual one. Um, and I think in many ways, this podcast was born out of that, that Baltimore slander, uh, notably uh, like Trump. Uh, using your background as a uh, public health nerd, I read that, uh, <laughs> and in social marketing, what are some of the facts that you've learned about Baltimore that are that's not often in that conversation when it's discourse around the city? I mean, Tucker has a, a lot he should uh, read up on. Uh, <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot of uh, not of I think willful ignorance that's going on there, um, and so drawing on the public health nerd in me, like what I. One thing that was really driving me um, early in this work, especially, was looking at the 20 year life expectancy gap between neighborhoods. Like, I, that just floored me when I saw that um, number. I was like, that's not, that shouldn't be happening, you know? And like, it, it led me to be digging into, like, well, what is going on? And um, the more that I kind of came to understand the city and was in a lot of different conversations at the time, I was like, this is ultimately about disinvestment. This is ultimately about, you know, rooted in racism, mm -hmm. rooted in histories of, um, of separation and segregation for economic gain for some and for, and disinvesting other places. And that's ultimately how I made this kind of like left turn from public health into, um, doing work with entrepreneurs and small business owners and, and grassroots leaders. Cause I was like, well, if it's all about kind of that access to resources, like it's got to be, um, the solutions also need to be rooted in that. This is not just like one thing that's going on. This is about like the, um, 
the walls that get created mm-hmm. and, um, very intentionally and sometimes even very physically, right? Like yeah. you can, there's places in Baltimore you can drive around where like the curb cuts don't make sense and you can only <laughs> drive out of the neighborhood and not in, or yeah. you can, you know, there's like walls and fences. Um, there's a professor at Micah that, uh, writes, wrote a book about, um, architecture of exclusion. Mm. And like, and I think that that's like, that's something Tucker and whoever else like should be understanding is like, this is, people are always um, characterizing social challenges if it's like rooted in personal choice instead of all of these structures that mm-hmm. are created generations ago, well before we even show up in the world as individuals. And like, if we're not working in those root causes, if we're not working at the systems level, um, you know, everything else we're describing is all just like symptoms. It's all just, it's the froth that's reaching the surface. Absolutely. Um, I, I always use this analogy, I borrow, um, but it's, it's kind of like when, when people, it's, it's not even an analogy, it's more of a saying when, when people say, oh, this is broken. No, 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 it is, it was built that way. It, it's, it's refined. Uh, and some of these things that were very overt, it's like, no, we're telling you exactly what we're doing. No, it's just there. And it's like, oh, I don't know what we're doing. And it, it's this kind of like overarching gaslighting that's happening. It's like, so oh, you're, you're crazy. None of that's happening. It's wild. I mean, and I think like on the flip side of what other, what people I think should know about Baltimore is like, there's so much clarity about that fact here and mm-hmm. people are operating from a place of, um, like that commitment to that I was describing earlier, like I think comes from just, um, people understanding like all of those structures that are going on them moving from a place to shift those patterns. And mm-hmm. I think people are like really, um, creative and, tenacious and like in many ways like joyful in the way that they go about those those kind that kind of work like people do it in community they do it with like a lot of like um beauty associated with it and care associated with it and i think that doesn't get told enough either you know the way the the people that are working on the other side of like um those realities that are like working to shift it and like build something a lot more beautiful are also the city is really full of that yeah, that's absolutely something that gets missed. And I think like what I try to do with this series is try to be like authentic in it. And often it, it's this notion of, oh, you're only saying the good stuff. I was like, no, what's the real stuff? And we hear about, and I think it's so just so one-sided, we hear about all of these challenges, all of these bad things, but never anything that really leads to that investment, leads to that kind of like Baltimore pride. Like there are other cities that have a history of weird things, violence, all of that different stuff that is usually affixed to us here. But we look at their culture. We look at, oh man, Philadelphia, get a cheesesteak. It's like, cool, I, I love Philly, but also they've got some things too, like any urban city would. So, and, and that's really what the root and what the focus of a lot of these conversations are. So what is your vision uh, for a better Baltimore? Um, what's, what, what are some of the complex challenges that you've encountered? I think you, you've touched on those a little bit. And what does growth look like? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the, like, coming back to that question around, like, s- structural um, barriers that are all over the city, like, I just, I wish that that would go away, you know, or, or I would love for it, um, it to be true that your zip code doesn't have such a bearing <laughs> on where you go in the world and right. on, like, the access that you can get to be able to realize your dreams. And, like, um, I'm going back to the um, work that I was doing at White Lock Farm, you'd meet these, like, kids in the neighborhood who were, you could feel, like, how bright and full of potential they were, and it was, like, I felt... Um, it was really important for kids to be able to see a lot of versions of the world that they can, and to have pathways into like being able to realize their, their dreams. Yeah. And, um, there was a kid visiting here one day that was like walking down the hallway and he goes up to the vending machine. He was like, I wish that this worked the way that it does in my dreams. <laughs> it was like amazing. Like, what is this vending machine you're dreaming up? And I just like, I just know that kind of, um, electricity and like potential is like is everywhere in the city and um so those barriers like if you could take the lid off of that if you Mm. could kind of actually make pathways for kids to um progress towards their dreams to be able but also to like 
dream wider dreams, you know, seeing lots of examples of people succeeding in all kinds of realities. Like, yeah. um, and then I think what it takes to get there is for all of those systems and structures to care far more about people. Yeah. Like people, people, residents of the city. I think there's like a lot of um, loyalty to you know, the way that money and power currently works that mm -hmm. um, isn't serving us. And it's not, it's really short term thinking. And like the long term thinking would be like letting the human potential of this city like truly ma be maximized. Yeah, um, and usually, and going back to it, like, it's funny how it's used when there's that criticism about Baltimore. Like, I don't hear as much criticism about Baltimore as, like, a, a place where people live as much as it's passively about the people, but it's almost, like, directly about the people. It's not like, oh, man, Baltimore, just uh, the real estate, the this, the that, the street signs are so weird. It's like, no, you really are talking about the people, but, you know, there there are people here. There are people with unique stories and people that, to, to, to what you were getting at, I, I think, um, that investment has to be made. That's, that's who's going to save us, per se. The people, we're going to save ourselves and not... Mm -hmm. Like, I joke with some people when it comes to, like, the grant cycles and money and all of that different stuff. It's like, we're, we're told there's a pie that has eight fair slices. There's really two slices, and the rest of them are earmarked for other things. And I was like, I don't know that, but I'm pretty good at reasoning things. And that's just kind of what I was looking at. So going to it, it's like that investment, you can see it's almost not there, or it's targeting certain people that may represent a certain thing, but really it's not being spread out in a way that everyone has a fair shake to really live their, their dream and have that opportunity to really grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, a big motivator back when we were getting founded here, mm -hmm. but also now is like, how do we grow that pie? How do we, like, if that pie isn't playing by the right rules, like change the rules, build a different pie. Like, I, you know, I think, um, that's something that's kind of amazing, working with like innovators and yeah. people that are part of um, a larger, like many of our members and other folks are part of like national networks, global networks. And so they do, they bring in new possibilities here so that we don't have to just be um, fighting over the small pie. Like all of that um, sense of scarcity is, yeah. it, it creates fear. And when people act from fear, then they're not, um, they're not realizing kind of full potential. And so like, and I think the city operates from that place all the time from a narrative perspective. Um, and yeah, you know, I could, I could get in, whether is that intentional, you know, is that, you know, whatever, but, um, yeah. No, no, scarcity is, is definitely a thing. You, you hear it when it comes to, like, we're sticker recording this and we're still in a pandemic, and you've kind of heard different pieces of it, and they, the sound bites get diminished, but, oh, yeah, you got everything you're going to get. It's like, it's a pandemic. You can't ration out masks and vaccines. What are you saying? And it kind of creates and continues this notion of scarcity, and even when it comes to one's health, and there's only so many opportunities. It's like, again, scarcity, and... It leads to at at minimum competition, but at at worst, it leads to weird things like corruption and such. And I can go on my soapbox. I know. And I know we could get really dark on all of this, but I also, you know, I don't know. I think um, being able to um, create abundance is something that I think about a lot. Like, hmm. and that's something I think that community building does that it's actually a generative act that yeah. you can you can go from kind of zero to one but just through sort of the energy of it yeah. or this is what entrepreneurs do all the time they go from being like i'm just thinking about a thing to like i'm actually physically building it i'm hiring people it's like you're, you're you can create realities and i think there's that kind of power is like in us in all kinds of ways and like it's I think the system wants to think like we have to wait for them to save us or that we have to wait for everything to come from outside and like um, I think that about that a lot like what, well, what if we don't like where are the places where we can just step into making something else happen yeah it's um it's, it's one of those things like I always look at like music or the way that things were depicted it's like no one signed that person yet 
how can we put our stamp on them? It, it has that kind of vibe. And if a person that has whatever the commodity is, uh, I don't need anybody. I think I'm all set. No, 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 no. You need backing. You need to scale. You need to do all of these different things. And it's like, I don't need your help <laughs> to do this. Why are you getting involved? Because mm-hmm. that, that seems to be so counter because the, the idea of scarcity is created and these, these notions of why a person may be doing something. It's like, no, let's take you away from the, your reasoning. Let's say for me doing this. I love Baltimore. I want to. I want to show Baltimore in, in this way. No, no, no. We need to scale this. Talk mm. to these people. It's like I don't think I'm all set. I mm-hmm. think I'm all good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so let's talk about triumphs and failures. And what comes to mind when you think of either of those? And I think with it, what did you learn from from what what comes to mind? Hmm. Um. Because people say I got nothing but wins. It's like. I sure. <laughs> yeah, there's a um, one of my favorite entrepreneurs and, and founders in the city is Jamila Banu from Oy and Handmade, and um, she has a phrase: "You're either winning or learning." And like, I think I'm learning all the time. I, I feel I set into this work being like, okay, like I, I really want to be learning every day, like or always being challenged. I got way more of that than I ever thought I was going to. So like, it's weird. Like I think some of the triumphs and failures are sort of, um, two sides of the same coin. A lot of times, like you're, um, if you're trying new things and kind of pushing yourself into new realms, you're gonna fail. Like, so in some ways, like failure can be this sign of success that you're not just like resting in what you are, you know, you're great at. Um, but yeah, I mean the specifics, (laughs) I think, we, I learned early on like how massive it was to um, take care of the people that are right around you, right? Like the, your team, your like in yourself, your you know that you that you can kind of imagine in the work that it's like all about kind of how far can you reach or how big can something get or how like you said you know there's pressure to scale. Yeah. Actually, like everything that you do with your even your thoughts and your speech and your own habits extends out to then how your team's doing, extends to how your community's doing, extends to how the work actually is. And so I think that was like an early learning with plenty of bumps in the road that like it solidified that, um, that learning, but it was like, um, important. And, uh, Adrian Marie Brown is, uh, somebody that a lot of folks in this community have read, um, this book, Emergent Strategy, and she talks about fractals. Mm -hmm. And that's like this image that I love so much is like, is that the small becomes all of these, larger patterns and so I think that's a it's like a it's something related to triumph and failure is just like starting to encode that lesson and come back to it over and over again it's like set the pattern you want to see and know that trust that it will replicate itself so you better do a good job with it <laughs> yeah you're, you're like um I like guys uh we, we get these like goofy sport analogies sometimes it's like yeah man you start choosing to fail you just continue being fine with failing it's like sure and but I think as I start to read maybe what the actual source of some of that stuff is it's like oh this is what this meant there because it, I, I ignore it. I was like, I'm not lifting weights. I'm not shooting a basketball. I'm not running on the field. But kind of just uh, thinking about it, I've been really in this deep dive of pretty much like everything Robert Greene. Mm. And just over and over. And it's one that I'm on now, the like daily habit habits. And I was like, look. He's like, yes, definitely read the day's uh, habit. I was like, oh, my gosh. I was like, I'm already behind this year. i got to go back months. I'm already failing. I'm already screwing up. <laughs> Um, and of course I checked what my birthday was and I was like, I was like, hopefully nothing bad. Hopefully nothing bad. And it's like, you will lose your hair. I was like, no. no. <laughs> so, but I, I think with it, it's a lot of gems that kind of come out of it that just kind of set like how you approach your work, how you approach your, your day to day and how those things, you, you kind of create habits and you kind of create things that you're comfortable with. And I just realized maybe through listening to the book guy, listening over and over and over again of, um, you can get comfortable with anything. Mm-hmm. And I think when you start to extend and stretch, it might be, it's like, it's like lifting weights. It's like, Oh, this is not easy. Right. But you're getting stronger, you're getting more endurance, you're getting more whatever from it, so just keep at it. Yeah. Um, again, speaking of gyms, 
they, I think there's a lot of value in the gems that are dropped in this podcast, and I'm saying that as a shameless plug for myself because I get the great answers. All the great answers. <laughs> Are there, and there are so many websites out there, right, that are saying we can help you with everything. This is how you do it. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of, we're masters at this. Uh, we're, we're experts. Um, and they provide entrepreneurs and people trying to get to that, that realm, like just different tips and so on. But for you, what are some of the resources that you would suggest? Because there's a lot of, ultimately, I guess what I'm trying to do here is maybe from your vantage point, demystify some of the things that people may encounter. It's like, here's the five tips of being successful. Or here's the five ways that you can grow your business in two days mm -hmm. or what have you. What are some of the resources or things that you find valuable in that kind of realm of growing as a uh, entrepreneur or as a person in this kind of realm? Yeah. Well, I mean, if anyone's saying it's fast and easy, that's probably not your resource. Uh, um, so, and, and I think people should really tr like trust their gut um, when they're looking at things that are out there. There's a lot of people that can um, make a lot of promises, and there's some kind of self-interest behind it. So, I think you know, always look, you know, wh what's behind this? What are the people? Who are the people? And one thing that I'm really proud of Impact Hub being part of right now is, it's called the Base Network, um, the uh, Business Advice and Support for Equity, that's what it stands for. That's great. And um, it's coordinated out of the BDC, but it's like there's, which is the Baltimore Development Corporation, not historically known for being amazing supporters of small businesses, right? Like there's a lot of um, reputational things that they need to overcome in terms of getting the resources on the ground. Like we said before, like invest in the residents, right? Mm -hmm. And um, over the last couple years, because of the pandemic, you know, there's been a big awakening around how incredibly important small businesses are in the city and the way that they are our fabric. There are neighborhoods, there are meeting points, there are vibrancy, right? And yeah. so um, in order to be able to be sure that all the resources that were coming out quickly were actually making it into the hands of black and brown business owners who get missed a lot of times when you're relying on the same systems over and over again to um, create access, sure. um, they sort of, there's a longer story to this, but the, uh, a network was formed around this for that was based on people that had like trusted relationships in a lot of different communities, neighborhoods, networks of entrepreneurs. And so there's 18 different partners that are all affiliated with this larger network to be able to help get information out and to be able to also start to get resources out. So there were... Um, there's going to be three rounds of grants this year for small businesses. Um, the first round just closed. There were over 700 applications. Wow. And the money is substantial. It's not a loan. You don't have to pay it back. It's money that people can um, get to grow. You don't have to be impacted by COVID either. It's like sort of about growing our economy forward from the place where we are. Yeah. And the network has informed the way that that works and the way that it gets reviewed and what are the criteria. And there's this really intentional effort to make sure that the resources that are coming out are equitable, like that they're, they're going to places that haven't had the investment before. And if you look at the list of partners, um, it's a lot of people that we're excited to work with. So um, there's uh, Baltimore Creative uh, Acceleration Network. I'm trying not to do all the acronyms. BCAN yeah. is like um, out, of, out of MICA and does amazing support with creatives. They're part of that network. Um, Made in Baltimore, which is a uh, like, huge network of makers in the city and yes. runs pop-up shops, um, is part of that. Innovation Works that runs programming um, to support social entrepreneurs specifically to grow at all different stages. Um, we're in it. Um, and, and then there's also so those those people all give kind of technical assistance, run programming, run workshops, run trainings. They're all good to follow along with. We're all changing what we do all the time, and yeah. it's usually a lot of um, ways to engage and plug in. And then there's also people in that group that are capital providers, like beyond just what's coming out from the city. So there's like Latino Economic Development Center, which gives low, they have all kinds of financial products, um, not just serving the Latino community, but 
everybody speaks Spanish, and so yeah. folks can actually uh, get good advice in their first language. Um, there's the Baltimore Roundtable for Economic Democracy that works with cooperatives, and they're really rad. Um, they've had a lot of businesses convert to cooperate to become co worker-owned cooperatives this year, and um, man, it's just like the Harker Brothers, one of my favorite local businesses. Shout and out. Yeah. Just like watching them convert to worker-owned cooperative um, this year, or I guess it was last year at this point, I was like in tears. It's just like, and then they just keep getting better at the work that they do. So, in any case, that's just a few people that are part of that network. Um, and something that's really cool that that group is doing is putting out um, a vendor directory too. So. Another type of small business, we find a lot of people that are consultants that do graphic design or do copywriting or do podcasting or do um, <laughs> accounting or legal or, you know, any kinds of types of services that might support a business to grow. And so we're all, that network is also helping to pull all of um, our networks into a vendor directory so that yeah. small businesses can find people that can actually, like, give them good advice and support. We're vetting people. Um, so that's a big plug for that, but it is a one-stop shop where you can kind of, you can see those partners and you can dig into all the work they're doing. Um, and then the other, the other plug I'll make for now <laughs> is we're, you know, speaking of websites is we're, um, we're just launching a big partnership with GoDaddy, um, the national company to be able to help small businesses build websites out or build their digital presence. Yeah. And, um, that's called the empower program and that's empowerbaltimore.com. And, uh, our first program is going to be kicking off in February with a big launch event. So that's another place where we're doing that on, like we're driving it locally, but we're also doing it with a large partner network. And so we're like, it's, you know, we're going to be connecting people to the other resources that are in town um, as they go through the program. I love what I'm hearing. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's important. I think Oftentimes, I go back to maybe the the first episode of, of this podcast, and we were uh, so myself and James Nasty, and uh, we were talking about just like one of the things that uh, I think creatives, and to extend further, like um, creative entrepreneur or entrepreneurs, uh, kind of run into. You just don't have your things in order, your, mm. your paperwork in order, these things in order to really apply for those grants, or get access to those grants, or just have familiarity with it. And I mean, I have a college degree, I don't. I was like, what's this paperwork again? Huh? Does it put my name on there? Is that X? And uh, but being able to connect with someone who can help in that regard, and maybe you can foster a partnership or a relationship, and kind of trade in that. It's like for some for certain artists that's like I know painting, I know oil, I don't know paperwork, and it's like you can grow and you can learn it. But what are you more efficient at? And that's the way that I've started to look at what I do and kind of how I converse with people who may reach out to me from a consultory perspective. It's like, what are you efficient at? And it's like, that's how you start bringing in people to maybe partner with, whether it be hiring an assistant, hiring someone to do the things that you're not good at. Because mm -hmm. there is some shoddy social media that happens. <laughs> I, I'll leave that it's out where there. it's at. It's I'll out there. It's <laughs> yeah, I mean, so many entrepreneurs, I think, feel the pressure to like be everything, do everything themselves, and um, there can be so much pressure on you. How could we possibly be great at everything? And so, like, mm -hmm. it's just you can't. So it's great um, to be helping to build visibility around like where you can go for support. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's that it's the grind culture, you know. Uh, what is it? Uh, your 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 hustles, your jobs. It's like, oh my God, just can I can I just rest? Why why am I doing everything? Right. I just I just want five, just five minutes. Um, so I got two more questions before I get to the ridiculous questions. I'm just letting you know that it's like here's your warning. Your, uh -huh, your two questions. Uh -huh, they're coming. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I and I think you you keyed in. I think you touched on this, but if you can key in on it a bit more, that would be great. Um, what do you find most rewarding about your work here with the uh, Impact Hub? Um, it's the people. You know, it comes down to that is like the core of everything. I mean, the the team members that we've had are. I, I've been like family. Um, the like many of our long-term members um, are people who have like been able to see go from that idea phase to like actually really building things out and growing something. Um, that's a pretty amazing thing to witness. Uh, it's like um, 
I don't know, kids, but I feel like it would be like what it would be like to watch a kid grow up, you know, it's just like, wow, like that was just an idea. And now it's, um, it's walking and talking and doing a thing. I think being able to be like front seat to that process. I mean, it's a a creative process, right? Um, is really cool. And then I think something I almost underappreciated until the pandemic was going on is just how much spontaneous interaction was able to happen by have, by being in space. And like, um, now like this, the energy has been coming back over the last few months, which is really nice as people are able to like come back together. Um, and when people pop in, that you weren't expecting to see and it wasn't, you're like able to have conversations you weren't expecting to have, like that kind of serendipity and spontaneity is like very energizing. You can be having a bad day and you walk in and you're like, oh my God, it's so-and-so and and they're having some great conversation. You're like, oh, you guys know each other. Oh, you're working on this thing. And like, it's so um, animating. I think it's a part of the human experience that we actually under value um, until we've all been sitting alone in our houses and <laughs> for two years. Uh, yes. <laughs> and because um, it can it can like pull you out of your just like your own whatever track you easily get into on your own. Like it's that's something I think community is like so amazing at doing is like it can like lift you to some other place, expose you to some other idea. Yeah, it was. Um very inviting when I came through the door because I was like, I don't know how to get in here. Do I teleport? What do I do? Do I climb? And, uh, but yeah, it was very inviting. And that was that, that definitely that energy of like, Oh, Hey, you're here. Hi. <laughs> Whereas sometimes I'll go to, to someone's space and it's like, Ugh, why are you here? I was like, we scheduled a thing. What? Are, what? <laughs> um, so this is the last question I have with the actual questions. You didn't get this one. So it's, um, we're freestyling here. Uh, <laughs> For, for, for what you do day to day, what would you say the three most important things are for you? It can be something that is like a, 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 a positive attitude. Uh, it can be something like a computer or what have you. But what do you say are like the three most important things for you to do what you do? That's a great question. Um, I have coffee with my husband every single morning, and it's like my first meeting of the day. Um, is just like sitting down over the French press and like getting into I don't know whatever the headspace of the day is going to be. He also works with entrepreneurs. Um, he runs the Made in Baltimore program, and so like we talk about work way too much at home. But also, <laughs> I don't know. It's like it's nice to be able to kick ideas back and forth, and like so he's a very grounding force. Um, so shout out to Andy. Um, it's a necessary part of my day. Um, we just got a puppy. <laughs> and so actually the other, like part of the motivation for getting a puppy or being a dog was like building in more, um, breaks and rest and those things you just mentioned, like being able to, um, also, have a concrete reminder of like the many priorities and um, that we can hold and the like not losing sight of like yourself or your just what it can do to go outside and take a walk and kind of come back to um, a new headspace that's not just the grinding through it yeah. um, and then yeah um, gotta be able to like laugh about things I think it's important to just like have people you can be dead honest with and be able to vent when you need to but also to be able to like let it go and be um make jokes tell tell stories like Mm. that kind of side of things is like vital to the day-to-day absolutely I I completely agree uh so now it's tough as a rapid fire question. All right. All right. So the way that these work, because some people don't seem to get it. Some people are terrified of them because they think I'm just going to ask them just something that's just like, yeah, so when I mean, you killed that person, it's like, what? That never happened. <laughs> it's like, well, I'm in a true crime podcast. Um, but uh, it's basically answer it as briefly as you can. And whatever's true at that moment, that's what's true. Um, so hold on for one second. I just want to adjust my mic because I'm hearing like my <clears throat> lips all over everything. Oh God, just moving around. So, uh, so let's see. First question, favorite movie. Princess Bride was my favorite movie growing up and I watched it 
very many times. I don't know if it stays at the top of that list, but it just like it had gotten to that spot and. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. All right. Uh, what is your favorite metaphor for describing entrepreneurship? Um, that it's like a, watching a person ride a tiger because the people that are watching that guy are like, oh my God, it's amazing. You're so brave riding this tiger. You must be so skilled. And the guy on the tiger is like, what am I doing? Why is this happening? This feels really dangerous. Yep. I immediately thought of, um, I don't know if you watched that uh, series, the toys yeah. that made us or have you, uh, but they were talking about the story of like the He-Man action figures mm. and it's like the tiger's not the scale and the guy that's like developing is a battle cat's like the tiger that He-Man rides. And it was like, I don't give a shit, put a saddle on it. And I was like, that's really funny to me. And that's immediately what I thought of when he said a person riding a tiger. So all in all, He-Man uh, is an entrepreneur. Yeah. Felt learned anything today. There you go. Besides money. What are your favorite ways to compensate people? Hmm. Visibility and storytelling matters. Mm -hmm. um, and being able to do that on people's own terms. Um, and connections, introducing people to, to people. Um, those usually are on the same scale as compensation because like, you know, it's a different kind of thing. But the, I would say like, that's a, that's another way that we like lend support to people that I lend support. That's, that's big. Whenever, cause whenever I have money ish conversations with people, I was like, that's not the root cause though. Like wherever you might need right now, like sure, that's a real thing. But also it's like, mm, sometimes access is great. Sometimes like being in that room is like, that opened you up to so many different things. And even when you're like in the, the, the job world and it's like, oh, do you want the title or do you want the money? It's like, mm, I'll take the title actually. Mm -hmm. I also take advice very seriously. Like I, a pet peeve of mine is like watching anybody get bad advice. I'm just like, don't, please, no, don't. <laughs> um, and I, so I like, I really, um, that's another way to support people is just to be able to like give an honest assessment from your experience. Yeah. Uh, I want to put one more in here because you said a thing earlier that I want to get some feedback on. Uh, this is the quickest one. Which one? Be more, Balmer, or Baltimore? Hmm, Baltimore. Okay. You've passed the test because a lot of us hate Be more. Be more. It's not great. It's <laughs> wow buns. Um, it's now we all like what we like. What are you particularly snobbish about, and what are you more down to earth about? snobbish about um it's so funny just because we already conjured taharka into the conversation i'm now like becoming like a real like ice cream snob you know i'm mm. just like although everything they do is good but yeah it's like i mean i don't know do you meet a bad ice cream really but i just they're just like operating at the top of their game um um i like a good pen i'm real picky at about a pen i'll throw a bad pen out you too I'm just like, I want it. I want a certain type. And I only like black ink, by the way. Anything mm. other than black ink. It's like, get this out of here. What is this mm -hmm. commoner pen? Mm -hmm. I'm looking for like a felt tip or something. Wow. Something where it like really flows easily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's how I sign my signature. It's like, no, I switch pens for this. Like, what are we doing? Oh, yeah. I, I have a, like, I carry pens around in my fanny pack. And often a Sharpie <laughs> marker also, because, you know. That's why I have mm -hmm. um, what And what am I down to earth about? Um... Because some people have a vibe of, yeah, I don't go to dive bars. It's like, I will go to a dive bar. Like, oh, yeah. um, I'm, I'm snobbish about some food because I know a few chefs now. I was like, uh, 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 a little too much bacon and cheese on there. Those already taste good. Your meat sub. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. I mean, I think for the viewers at home, like, I don't really deal with my hair. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, I'm pretty like, just let it dry in the air, you know? Um, and I, I think actually getting like fashion at all. I like, I, li I think it's fun to like accessorize and play around and whatever, but I also like, will just get into wearing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and I think it's like, yeah, there's like, there's something to that whole Steve Jobs mode of like just black turtlenecks cause you are reducing your decision load. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll be like, Oh yeah, this is like on the dresser from yesterday. I'll put it back on. I get decision fatigue all the time. And I remember, um, I had an interview with Yuri Mail, Yuri Mile rather. And, uh, I was telling him, I was like, look, man, 
some of the work you guys are doing with Under Armour. It's like, I've just been wearing Under Armour leggings for like the last like two years. And sometimes I forget to change them. He's like, no, you got to change those pretty <laughs> regularly. I was like, look, man, it's just Carhartt hoodie, sneakers. I might put on a hat, mm-hmm. but that's about it. Mm-hmm. Now, this is the bonus one I throw in here because you mentioned to Hawker Brothers. Favorite flavor? Oof. It would ch- it changes with like whatever's in the bowl. Uh, the one we had last night um, is an olive oil flavor, which is unbelievably really? good. Yeah. Although, uh, like the favorite that's been a recent hit is the, their latest like Tupac flavor mm-hmm. is so good. It's like how can you be like <laughs> sweet and crunchy but not too sweet and full of real fruit? It's like it's just it's beautifully composed. I will, so I will shout both those flavors out. And I'll say a classic classic is roasted strawberry. Okay, that's that's a winner right it. there. That's a great flavor. Yeah. Um, so that's all the questions that I had, but I want to thank you for coming on to this podcast. And I want to invite you to replug because you did some plugs. I want to invite you to replug, plug whatever you want to plug. Um, the Empower program is coming up. It's going to be going on um, all throughout 2022. And so that's a place, empowerbaltimore.com. Check it out if people want to get websites. Um, and... I don't know if this is going to be coming out before February 17th. Um, so we've got a big uh, event coming up on February 17th at Center Stage that I'm excited about. Um, and then, yeah, man, co-working is still going on here at Impact Hub. People can come back and be among people. We're starting to kind of wind programming up again to p- build cultivating connections and um, try to help people come back into the world, you know. Uh, and so... Come, you know, that's my plug, I guess. Coming back into, come back into the world, everybody. Absolutely. So there you have. Oh, so there you have it. Um, for Michelle Geis of Impact Hub, I am Rob Lee, saying that there is community in and around Baltimore. Uh, you just gotta look for it. Mm-hmm.